Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, PCS uh, seminar. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, to have with us uh, Professor Keith Slevin. Um, uh, and uh, this seminar is a part of our advanced study group uh, on deep learning in quantum phase transitions. And I would like to ask our uh, convener of the group, uh, Professor Viktor Kagalowski, to uh, say a few words about the group and our today's speaker. Uh, please, Professor Kagalowski. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, uh, I'm really glad that uh, we are all, all together with the people from the June and from all over the world, that our advanced study group hopefully will be in physical presence next year. But this year we repeat what we have done the last year. We'll have four talks of our participants. And I'll just briefly mention the, that uh, the next talk next week will be by Ilya Jerome on uh, April 20th, exactly at the same time. Then there will be a talk which will be available for the participants from the Far East, but not from Europe and Middle East, because it will be talked by Sergei Kravchenko on April 28th. It will be in American Kore uh, Korean time. And then in one uh, month, uh, there will be a, a, another talk by, uh, uh, by Tommy uh, Atsuki on uh, June 1st. But obviously, you will get all the possible updates. And it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Keith Slevin, who graduated from the place you can see behind him, and you will see behind him from the Cambridge, from the original Cambridge of UK, and also as well in Imperial College. And uh, he devoted all his life to computational research of Anderson localization and quantum transport phenomena. And if, um, I mean, I would say just one word that if anyone misses uh, the critical exponent seven over three, then uh, Keith and Tommy are responsible for this. So Choker Coddington model doesn't produce seven over three, it's 2.62. And this is one of the greatest changes in my, in my lifetime in critical exponents. I also find it very symbolic that uh, today's our first uh, advanced study group talk is on the my country independence day. So hopefully we will soon all be independent and come together. Yes, please. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Victor, for the invitation. And also uh, thank you to uh, Professor Flack for the uh, invitation uh, to talk to you. I'm very glad to have this opportunity. Um, so the subject of my talk is uh, multifractality and the distribution of the condo temperature at the Anderson transition. Uh, let me mention my, oops, well, let me mention my collaborators. Uh, in this work, they are Stefan Ketterman from Jacobs University in Bremen and uh, Tommy Otsuki from Sofia University in Tokyo. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, describing some numerical simulations. And so let me begin by uh, introducing the model which we have simulated. Uh, and that's Anderson's model of localization. Uh, uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, on the screen here. Uh, we have a cubic lattice. Uh, we have uh, orbitals. Uh, so the sites of this lattice are labeled by N. We have orbitals, which are localized on the sites. And we have a simple model with uh, random orbital energies, En, with some distribution, which is often taken to be, uh, as shown on the right-hand side, a uniform distribution uh, of width W. And this parameter W is what controls uh, the strength of the disorder. And then there is hopping to nearest neighbor sites, which is set to unity that sets the uh, energy scale. And then uh, the randomness of the orbital energies are measured in units of this uh, hopping energy. 
And this model is uh, one of the most well studied in the uh, uh, in, the, in Anderson localization, uh, both analytically and uh, especially uh, numerically. Uh, now, a few words about the Anderson transition. Uh, in principle, it occurs uh, for D greater than two. There are examples in two dimensions, but uh, that, that would be off, the, off, the, off today's topic. So let's say D greater than two. And what we have is if the disorder W, so I'll just remind you W was this uh, um, width of the uh, randomness of the of the uh, orbital energies. If there's no randomness, you have a, 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 a crystal uh, with a single, uh, a single band. And then we're, we're looking at what happens when we make the orbital energies random. And what happens is that if in three dimensions, for example, which is what we'll be discussing today, if the uh, disorder is uh, less than some critical value, you have diffusion. And if you look at wave functions, you see that they're, uh, okay, without disorder, they would be block states, but they are then become more random uh, as with the, with the, when you add the disorder, but they still fill up the whole sample. And then you find that uh, once you've increased the disorder, but you find that once you've increased the disorder sufficiently, uh, particularly there is some critical value of the disorder, Beyond that, the wave functions become localized. Now, I will illustrate this on the next slide, uh, but there is this then critical value of the disorder which separates a diffusive and a localized phase. And there is a phase transition, it's a quantum phase transition, uh, which occurs, uh, which is called the Anderson transition. If you look at, say, the conductivity, which you might uh, express using the uh, Einstein relation. Here we have a sigma conductivity, electronic, electron charge squared, density of states at the Fermi level and the diffusion constant. Um, what happens uh, uh, as you approach, okay, in the diffusive regime, D is of course finite, but as you approach the Anderson transition, the diffusion constant goes smoothly to zero and then you have a, you enter an insulating phase uh, and for W greater than WC, the diffusion constant is zero. And you have a phase then for W greater than WC, which is called the Anderson insulator. And the particular point about this is that the conductivity is zero, uh, even though the density of states at the Fermi level is finite. So it's different from a band insulator. Uh, and the reason it's an insulator is that the diffusion uh, has been suppressed by quantum interference. Okay, if you look at wave functions, so if you solve the Schrodinger equation for uh, the model I, uh, I showed, um, you have something like this. So uh, on, the, on the left, so A, you have a typical uh, wave. So what's being plotted here is the uh, psi squared, the intensity of the wave function, uh, uh, and you, a color scheme has been used to indicate uh, the points where it's larger uh, and, and smaller. And I think that some, you can see that the wave function fills uh, most of space. Uh, not everything is plotted in order to, 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 to make it visible, but uh, I think we're talking about 98%. Uh, but you can see that for the in for not too strong a disorder, you have a wave function which spreads over the sample. If you go to the right hand side, that's C, then um, you see that uh, for very for strong disorder, the intensity or the wave function intensity is uh, concentrated on a few sites of the lattice, or a, well, a, a small fraction of sites of the lattice, and the wave function is localized, the electron is localized in space, and most of the, uh, uh, on most of the sites, you have no wave function intensity or negligible wave function intensity. So A is uh, the diffusive regime or the metal, 
and C is the localized phase or the insulator, the Anderson insulator. Precisely at the transition, you have a, uh, a distribution of the wave function intensity, which is multifractal uh, and which uh, uh, is somewhat in between is in between this kind of localized behavior and, and the diffusive behavior in the two uh, uh, phases. And what I mean by multifractal is uh, illustrated here. If we um, so this is another simulation uh, of, a, of a, the Anderson model of size 100 cube. Uh, with the disorder tuned to be very close to the uh, at the transition. And what I've done is switch to an, a, diff, uh, a different variable called alpha, which is the log of the intensity divided by the log of the system size. And what I've done is, uh, so okay, uh, alpha small corresponds to uh, large intensity and alpha large corresponds to very uh, small intensity. And what you can see is that the if we focus on different uh, um, magnitudes of psi squared, the way that those points fill space is quite different, depending on which uh, region or which intensity uh, we look at, which intensity interval, interval we look at. Now in the plot, you see 80% of the wave function. Um, and you can see that the high intensity points are very, very few. They fill up very little of the uh, space. As you as you change, uh, as you go to lower intensity, it fills up more of space, and as you go to lower, it fills up more space again. And this different filling of space, depending on the intensity, is uh, typical of a multifractal. Uh, it can be associated with a uh, multifractal spectrum. And the way to see that is to look at the probability distribution of uh, this variable alpha. And here you see some work uh, by the group of Rudolf Roma in uh, Warwick University. Um, you see the distribution of alpha, this, very, this uh, uh, random variable alpha related to the wave function intensity. Here's the alpha, here's, here's the probability density. You see various sizes system, uh, and it turns out that uh, this distribution can be expressed basically as a constant times the system size to the power f of alpha minus d, where this f of alpha is the uh, multifractal spectrum. Uh, it looks, uh, okay, the multifractal spectrum itself is shown here. Uh, in the inset, that's the inset B. Uh, and at first approximation, and this will be important for today's talk, we're going to assume that this F of alpha can be described by a parabola. Obviously, you can see that it's not exactly a parabola, but as a rough approximation today, we'll be taking it as a parabola in what comes, uh, in what follows. Now, if you think about, uh, for example, uh, if I were to ask how many points are there with this value of intensity in, in with this intensity in this range in this cube, uh, and how that how that uh, number scales with l l to some power, that will be related to f of alpha. Uh, and so basically, f f of alpha tells you the, the fractal dimension of uh, of this range of of this range of intensities. Uh, and that's what's uh, written up here. Okay. Now, uh, today's talk is about the Kondo effect. Um, uh, excuse me, Professor Slavin. Yes? Uh, we have a question from Ihor. Uh, Ihor, please. Yes. Hello. So I want to clarify here. Uh, this PL of alpha, is it supposed to be a system size independent distribution or not? Uh, no, uh, it is not. Uh, if you would like to see a, a, a system size independent distribution, uh, what you can do is do um, 
uh, you can take, um, uh, sorry, I'm searching for the word, coarse graining. You can do coarse graining. And then, so here uh, we take the, we look at the intensity on one side. If I divide the system into small boxes and then add, uh, add the intensity in the box and then change the variable L here to the ratio of uh, the linear system size to the box size, then if you fix that ratio, this distribution will become size independent. But that's, uh, but then it will also depend on the ratio of the box size to the um, system size. In fact, it might be best, I may have a slide to show this. So let me, uh, let me pause for a moment and, and, and find that slide. Uh, if I have it, yes, I do. Okay. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Can you see my? Yes, it's, okay. it's still the same slide. Oh, can you see this? It's still the same slide? Yeah, same. Okay, let me, uh, let me try again. How about now? Yes, yeah, something new. Okay, good. So um, what you can do is, is uh, um, so yeah. what do I, you know, here we had this alpha defined in this way. Let's change the definition of alpha in this way. Let's take, divide the system into small boxes, take the weight of the, uh, take the intent, sum of the intensities in, in one box, for, of course, for all the boxes, uh, and then divide by this lambda, oh. which is the ratio of the box size to the system size. And then let's look at P of alpha. And then you get a scale invariant distribution at the transition. But if you look only at uh, P of uh, wave function intensity on one side, you have something which depends on, on the system size. Uh, excuse me, Professor Slevin, I, I believe uh, we have lost you for a moment, so we have missed uh, your explanation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Then I'll, I'll try again. Um, uh, can you hear me please. now? Yes, okay, yes, so, now we can hear you. So changing, uh, you know, doing this coarse graining and uh, defining mu to be the sum of the intensities in the box. And then... Uh, instead of dividing by the systems, the log of the system size, we divide by the ratio of the box size to the system size. Uh, and then we can ask, what is the distribution of this new variable alpha? And that variable has a size independent distribution at the Anderson transition. Of course, it depends on the ratio uh, of, uh, if I change lambda, this distribution will change but it will be size independent for uh, sufficiently large systems. Does this answer your question? Uh, yeah, more or less, but I'm still a little bit confused uh, about the purpose of that uh, PL of alpha distribution. So uh, oh, more about the introduction of this alpha values. So, if the, uh, the distribution that you analyze are not uh, universal, uh, what is the purpose of this uh, normalization? Uh, ah, no, uh, uh, f of alpha is universal. I the multifractal I spectrum is universal. So, so this f of uh, alpha is universal. And if I fix lambda here, this distribution will also be universal. I mean, for, for a given lambda, we will have the same distribution at the, at the Anderson transition in 3D with the system with uh, the time reversal symmetry and spin rotation symmetry. We will have the same curve, uh, providing we look at the same lambda. It's universal in that sense. Mm, I see. Yeah, and here, I see. Yeah, here the uh, F of alpha here is universal. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Okay, so let me move on to the condo effect. Uh, so uh, I think experimentally, this was discovered uh, or observed um, uh, in 1934. And then I think uh, people began to understand the origin of this uh, with the theoretical work of uh, Jung Kondo in 1964. This is why it's called a condo effect. Um, and it turns out that there is a uh, resistance minimum. So here's the temperature, here's resistance. Uh, and as you lower the temperature, uh, you find in some metals uh, that there is a, uh, a minimum of the resistance and at low temperature, uh, the uh, after some after you go below a certain temperature, the resistance starts to rise again. Uh, and this uh, effect was uh, uh, found to be related to the uh, presence of uh, magnetic impurities in the, in the, in the metal. Uh, for example, a famous example is iron in gold. Uh, and the interaction of the magnetic moments of the iron impurities with the conduction electrons. Uh, this was uh, studied uh, uh, very much after uh, Professor Kondo's paper and uh, led, uh, uh, there was a lot of theoretical work culminating, I think, uh, uh, in, the in the solution of it using the renormalization group uh, uh, by uh, Kenneth Wilson. Uh, now, for our purpose, uh, we are interested in, uh, so what happens? So uh, ab above what is called the condo temperature, uh, the uh, magnetic moment of the impurity is basically free and contributes uh, uh, a one over T-like, uh, Curie-like susceptibility to the magnetic susceptibility. And then below the condo temperature, the spin, uh, uh, and the conduction electrons form a, a singlet state uh, where the impurity, so what happens is the impurity spin is basically quenched and the contribution to the uh, magnetic susceptibility becomes uh, actually temperature independent. And this uh, interaction of the spin and the, uh, uh, and the conduction electrons it also produces this uh, rise in the electrical resistance. And uh, so uh, what we will be interested in is uh, if we have a system, a metal or a disordered system at the Anderson transition, uh, what, what kind of effect can we see in the, on the condo temperature? So, uh, to do that, we'll be using the nagaoka sewell equation, which is an approximate equation from which we can calculate the temperature, uh, Tk, the condo temperature, at which the, uh, uh, the magnetic moment is screened. So here is, here, we imagine now we have a metal and we have some uh, impurity in it with an exchange coupling J, which couples the electron uh, uh, the uh, conduction electrons with the magnetic impurity. And there is an approximate way to calculate this temperature, the condo temperature where this, um, you know, this crossover occurs between free spins to quench spins over here uh, uh, by solving this equation. Uh, uh, basically we have in this equation, the log so we imagine that we have an emetic magnetic impurity at uh, position R in the metal, uh, and uh, the Fermi energy is EF, and then TK, the condo temperature can be found by solving uh, this, uh, okay, F is defined like this. We were looking for the solution of F of TK equal to one. Now, it, it, what appears in the, uh, and what will be important in what follows, is what appears in this equation is the local density of states at the point R. There's an integration over all energies, so we need to integrate over the whole band of, of, of states. Uh, the local density of states looks like this. Here's the wave function intensity. Here's a delta function factor that you normally expect in the density of states. So it's the density of states at the point R. 
uh, and uh, from this equation, we can, if we solve this equation, so if we calculate the local density of states in our disordered system, for example, one method which I, I won't, I did not use in this study, but one method would be to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, find all the energies, find all the wave functions, calculate the local density of states at a point, and then solve this equation, and it would give you Tk, the temperature where you expect this kind of phenomenon to occur, where the uh, impurity spin should be quenched and there should be a change in the susceptibility. Uh, now, if you do this for a clean metal, by a clean metal, I mean, uh, let's take a density of states, which um, is uh, energy and position independent. So it's uh, perhaps a little unphysical, but let's say we have a band of width D and we assume that the energy uh, and uh, the local density of states is a constant in space and a constant, uh, in, a constant uh, uh, in energy. And then you can you can you can solve this equation uh, analytically, and you will find uh, uh, this result, well-known result for the condo temperature. Uh, the bandwidth D. Um, I apologize. I've used the same symbol uh, in an earlier slide for the diffusion constant. Uh, this D is not the diffusion constant. This D is the bandwidth as units of energy. Uh, and uh, you have this uh, relation of condo temperature to exchange coupling and local density of states and bandwidths. Okay, now, uh, okay, this was for a position and energy independent uh, uh, density of states, but the density of states, um, uh, excuse me for a moment. Uh, the density of states in, a, in, a, in the Anderson model or in a disordered solid in general is uh, uh, not at all constant. Uh, in particular, at the Anderson transition, it's, uh, uh, it looks something like this. Uh, you can see that there are, it has a, it's very structured. There are lots of peaks and troughs. Uh, okay, this is the same. So this is for a cube of size 64. I've put W exactly at the Anderson transition. Now this has been calculating using the KPM method. Uh, I might I will explain that a bit later. Um, uh, the important thing here is that the level spacing, so that there, there's a width of energy which is used uh, in the KPM method, which is basically the broadening of this delta function, and that's about one thousand times the level spacing in this uh, in this simulation. So we're not seeing anything related to level spacings. Um, uh, but you can see it's a very fluctuating quantity. Uh, uh, fl this is a logarithmic scale on the right on the right figure. It, fl it fluctuates over orders of magnitude, and uh, of course we can then expect that uh, there will be a lot of fluctu fluctuations of the condo temperature. Of course, the condo temperature, as you can see here, involves an integration over all energies. So it's not uh, simply a question of taking. The density of state, the local density of states at the Fermi level, you have to consider the integral over all energies in the band. Uh, but clearly, since we have fluctuations, it's not unreasonable to suppose that uh, uh, we should have uh, uh, large fluctuations in the condo temperature. Now, that was uh, anticipated, uh, uh, for example, by Mott. Uh, you could find uh, in his discussions of uh, the, the metal insula insulator transition in uh, dope semiconductors, for example, that, his, uh, that there should be um, a large range of condo temperatures, even uh, zero condo temperatures, so even free moments. Um, uh, there is a lot of previous work on this, on this uh, problem. I'm not going to attempt to review it all. Uh, there, you can look at this paper from 2012 on which I was a co-author. There are a lot of references in there. And there's also this more recent work uh, by uh, Hun Yong Lee and Stefan Ketman. Uh, there's also this pa paper by uh, uh, Ki Suk Kim and co-worker. Uh, and the work I'm really focusing on today is this work from 2019, uh, which is uh, an, America, uh, an attempt to numerically verify the prediction for the condo temperature distribution 
uh, which was presented in this 2012 paper. Uh, now, uh, but there is an awful lot of work before this, before this 2012 paper going right back uh, decades. Uh, uh, for references to that, please uh, uh, look at the references in this paper, 2012, or in these other more recent papers also. Uh, let me show some uh, previous numerical results, uh, published results from this one from 2006 called, called Naglia et al. And they simulated the Anderson model uh, in one, two and three dimensions. I show here some data for three dimensions. And this is the kind of uh, result they found. This is the, so they're showing here P of, uh, con this is the, pro the probability of the particular of condo temperatures versus uh, TK divided by TK0. This TK0 is the uh, temperature of the clean system that's used as a scale uh, to, uh, to comp for comparison with the disordered system. Uh, so the clean system would have, this would be one. And for weak disorder, you see you have fluctuations, but as you increase the disorder, the fluctuations become very large and there is a long tail uh, of uh, to low to very low condo temperatures. There are also free moments, uh, which are which are shown here. Uh, we're also discussing those a bit later. Um, and uh, what they found, for example, was that the uh, the tail of this uh, distribution of con this this uh, tail of the condo uh, condo temperature distribution for small condo temperatures at very low condo temperatures. Uh, had a power law behavior with minus uh, exponent of minus three quarters. That's the red line in the figure. Now this was, uh, these simulations were done on relatively small systems. This is a 13 by 13 by 13 cube and with a relatively small number of samples, about a thousand samples. Uh, and the, uh, uh, that's okay, that's one, uh, one set of numerical results. I will be coming to comment on these again a bit later. Uh, here's uh, some work from 2014 by uh, Hun Yong Lee and Stefan Ketman. Uh, this now is in 2D and uh, uh, larger systems. And again, you, uh, okay, we have uh, here the bottom figure, the bottom uh, figures C and D are of interest here. The upper figures show uh, uh, RKKY couplings. Uh, they're, they're very important, but they're not the subject of today's talk. Um, and uh, you can see a very, again, a very broad distribution. You see a, a kind of uh, typically a peak around, uh, well, it's become very broad actually uh, here. Here, I think we're starting out with a peak around the clean system and then it's broadening out. It, it, what they found was, uh, okay, here is, uh, well, you can see that clearly that we can also have enhancements of the condo temperature due to disorder, as well as these very small values of the condo temperature it becomes, and that's also visible here. You can see uh, it's, uh, you know, the temperature, the condo temperature can go up and it can go down and, we, and there are this long tail to low temperature condo, uh, low condo temperatures. And the size here was around 100, 100 square and I, I think uh, considerably more samples, I think around uh, uh, tens of thousands. Okay, now the, the prediction which I'm trying to um, uh, confirm is uh, this one, uh, rather, com rather complicated looking, but the important point is that we have, uh, 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 as we see, this actually simplifies quite a lot. There's a lot in this formula. I don't expect uh, to, uh, to be understood straight away, uh, but we have uh, basically the important factor is here. There is a power law tail uh, with an exponent eta over 2d minus one. This eta is the important thing. So let me, so, uh, let me discuss that. So what is eta? Well, eta turns out, it turns out that at the Anderson transition, the wave function intensities, uh, so here we look at, so let's look at some wave function intensities at the same point. 
but different wave functions. So obviously they'll have different energies. Uh, and you see that um, if the energies are close, this value is uh, enhanced. And if the energies are far, this value is uh, suppressed. And this, uh, these correlations, this enhancement of the correlation um, is, is controlled by this uh, exponent eta, which is a multi, uh, related to the multifractal uh, distribution f of alpha. And in fact, uh, if we approximate um, the uh, multifractal spectrum as a, as a parabola, so uh, as I mentioned, it's not really a parabola, but let's, let's, uh, it's not exactly a parabola, but it's a rough, rough, rough approximation, let's take it as a, as a parabola. Then one can calculate this exponent eta or one can relate it to alpha zero. I should perhaps explain what that was. So alpha zero is the position of the maximum of the, uh, so you can see that this multifractal spectrum has a maximum. It reaches the value three because this is three dimensions. And the position in alpha of this, uh, uh, of this value is called alpha zero. That's a universal number. And the exponent eta, which appears in this analytic uh, uh, formula for the um, for the condo temperature distribution is can be is related to um, or uh, sorry the exponent eta which appears here in these correlations is related to that f of alpha in this way eta is two alpha zero minus d within the parabolic approximation. Now one can also access. Uh, alpha zero by looking by looking numerically at f of alpha or a similar similar type of simulation. Uh, if I use this parabolic approximation, we'll have eta is about two. And it, but if we study it numerically directly, we'll find about 1.8, say. So slightly different value. And that will be a little, uh, that will be of some importance later. So you can see that this these multifractal correlations of the uh, of the eigenstates at the mobility edge in the, Ans the Anderson transition is reflected in the condo temperature distribution, particularly in the power law tail, where this factor becomes one. I shall explain that in a moment. Now this distribution applies only in a certain temperature range. It should be less than the condo temperature. How, how much less is, uh, I've written very much less, that's not quite true. Let's say just less than the, condo temperature of the clean system, and it should be larger than the level spacing of the system. And this, uh, so there are two things I would like you to, re to record here. We have a power law tail with an exponent eta, or exponent which is related to this universal number eta. Uh, so we should have a universal value for the exponent of this power law tail. And it applies only in a certain range of condo temperatures, not for condo temperatures that are too small below the level spacing and not for condo temperatures that are too large. Okay. So as I said, that looked very complicated. So I, I put Q of X, uh, this factor, call it Q of X. And it turns out that uh, provided X is not large, too large, and J is not too large. So X much less than one and J not too large we can take Q of X as one. And then we have a very simple formula for the condo temperature distribution. Uh, it's just a, a power law with uh, this universal exponent, uh, which is related to a number which can be determined from the multifractal spectrum. Okay. Now there are also, I'll also be showing some results for free moments, for the number of free moments. So let me say that this distribution applies to the non-zero condo temperatures. There's also a part of the condo temperature distribution where we have TK equals zero, a finite fraction of the, uh, of the impurities are unscreened. Uh, and uh, because of the disorder, they end up being unscreened. Uh, and uh, so they end up as free moments. And that fraction can also be predicted. Uh, and th this is the formula for that. Uh, and I'll be comparing this also with the numerics. Now, let me mention 
that uh, what happens if uh, TK is below the level spacing, uh, we have a different distribution, in particular, we have a different power law, which is not universal. And this is, in fact, what we think was seen in the previous numerical work. Uh, looking at the numbers in that paper in that simulation, uh, the, okay, TK over TK01 is here, but the level spacing here is about 0.1. And most of the data follow the power law below that. Uh, and so this uh, minus three quarters, uh, this exponent is not universal. In fact, it depends on the exchange coupling. Uh, and in fact, if you take the parameters that were, that were used in that simulation, you find that in fact, it agrees with this. So there's a non-universal part of the distribution below the level spacing, which is not of interest to us today. We're going to be interested in the universal part which is between the level spacing and the conduct temperature of a clean system. Okay, so the objectives in the work were to check the analytical prediction. Why? Because there are several uh, approximations in the, in, in the uh, analytic calculation because it's, uh, it's rather involved. And at some point, some approximations have to be made. For example, a parabolic uh, multifractal spectrum uh, pairwise correlations, uh, higher order correlations, I think are not taken into account if I understand correctly. Uh, so the first thing we want to know is, is the prediction correct? Uh, is there a power law tail? What's the exponent? Is it actually universal? And is the prediction for the number of free moments uh, also correct? Okay, so uh, we've used the kernel polynomial method. I'm not going to explain that since I think time is a little short. Um, but basically, it, it, it involves uh, expansion of the local density of states in terms of Chebyshev polynomials. It's a well-known method. There's an excellent review article here where you can learn about it. For our purpose, the main point is that when you do the expansion in terms of Chebyshev polynomials, we have to decide the order of the uh, expansion. And that order is related to the broadening, uh, or the, shall we say the resolution of uh, the determination of the uh, local density of states. Uh, and obviously, if you have more, more moments, if you calculate more moments and you get a higher order uh, Chebyshev uh, expansion, you have a higher energy resolution. So this will be important for us because the, in the simulation, we shall need uh, to be in the region where the, the um, level spacing is very small compared with the uh, condo temperature of the clean system. And we shall have to have enough moments in order to reach, but not exceed the, uh, uh, the level spacing. So this, this number should reach, but not become less than the level spacing. Okay, so the simulations were done like this. We generate uh, an ensemble of Anderson Hamiltonians, rescale them all to the interval for uh, Chebyshev polynomials, start a calculation with a certain number of moments, uh, calculate local density of states. This is what takes the time. Solve the nagok sewell equation, estimate TK. You then have to repeat the calculation with a larger number of moments to check if the calculation has converged. For example, you may find zero at the initially and uh, if you carry on increasing the number of moments, you find a finite value. Uh, and also you have to increase the number of moments until this converges. Um, however, once this uh, number of moments is such that we're resolving the level spacing, we stop and simply assign it as, a, as uh, this, in this case, we have a free moment, uh, an unscreened uh, magnetic impurity. Uh, there are various uh, uh, information about the uh, simulations here. So uh, we want a large system size. So basically the dynamic range that we can, we can hope to fit a power law to is less than TK zero and larger than the level spacing delta. So we need to make, so D here is the bandwidth. We need to make L large in order that we have enough a dynamic range. So we'd like J to be large. A large coupling gives us a higher TK zero. 
we'd like L to be large in order to make delta as small as possible. And then we have as big a range as possible in which to find uh, the, this universal distribution. So we did sim simulations for 64 cube and 96 cube uh, couplings four and six. And uh, we, we worked at the band center where the critical disorder is 16.54. And uh, these uh, summary of the of, uh, some result of the uh, some details of the simulation. Here is the uh, exchange coupling. Here's a system size, number of samples, around a hundred thousand uh, or sixty five thousand for small for the larger system size. Um, this is, these system sizes give us this kind of range, dynamic range in which we can look for the power law. So TK0, TK0 divided by delta is 14,000 for the smaller system size with J equal four, it's 26,000. So we have uh, three decades, four decades in which we can look for a power law. And we're looking at, we're typically simulating a million, a million um, oh, sorry, that's the number of, um, number of samples around 100,000, number of moments needed, uh, the, max, the maximum number of moments needed in order to get to delta is about 4 million in this case and a million here. Okay, it was, the simulations were done on the supercomputer at ISSP uh, where we have access to, or had access to 288 uh, uh, parallel processes. Um, and typically we're talking about 50 hours for the smaller system and 540 hours for the larger systems. And there's calculation time scaling as L to the six. Okay, so now let me slow down a little bit and let's look at the results. Here's uh, X, which is condo temperature divided by the condo temperature of the clean system. So condo temperature of the clean system would be here. This is for L equals 64 and exchange coupling. So L 96 cube system size and exchange coupling of four. And you can see uh, this would be, we would have, if it were a clean system you'd, with no disorder, you'd have a delta function here. And you can see that sometimes the condo temperature is enhanced. And of course, in a lot of cases, it's uh, dramatically reduced and there is clearly a tail at, uh, at small condo temperatures. I should say that the cases where TK equals zero is found are excluded. Uh, and let me say that, um, in our simulation, once we get to delta, the level spacing, uh, everything below delta, TK could in principle still be finite, but our simulation will say it will say it's zero because we're stopping once we reach uh, the level spacing. But we don't expect to miss too many uh, free moments by doing that. So this is for the this is the distribution for the uh, non-zero condo temperatures. And it's this distribution or this uh, distribution which we'd like to check, is this, uh, does this agree with this universal distribution which is predicted uh, uh, for the condo temperature? And we're expecting it to apply in a certain range uh, below one here, some, but where exactly, uh, and above the level spacing. Now it's actually convenient to change the variable uh, to the reciprocal. So that's what I'm going to do next. So instead of looking at X, I'm going to look at Y, which is zero uh, condo, te uh, sorry, uh, condo temperature of the clean system divided by TK. So we're just inverting what we had before. And then uh, we're expecting that uh, this will have some power law distribution for in some range with a minimum and a maximum. Outside that range, we expect that the analytic prediction is not correct. So we have to consider that carefully when trying to check it. And the exponent beta here is of course related to the exponent on the previous, uh, uh, previously mentioned. It's now one plus e to over two d. D here is the dimension, that's three. Okay, here's some data for y. i have just taken one over x and then plotting another histogram. You can see the kind of uh, uh, curve we get. Um, it look, you see here the long tail to low condo temperatures now is at large Y. Okay, uh, the next problem is, um, okay, what do we want to do? Well, 
we have a random variable y. We think it's distributed like this. I should say, um, okay, uh, let's, let's for the moment suppose that we, we have only to worry about um, uh, y min. So for y greater than y min, we have this distribution and we'll assume that y max initially is infinity. Uh, how would we estimate beta? find the standard error of that estimate. How do we estimate y min, where the power law set, sets in? And uh, how can we check that the date that the, uh, that the analytic prediction and the agreement uh, is sufficiently good that it's plausible that we have a power law tail? And to do that, we need to calculate something called goodness of fit. Uh, so what I'm going to be describing next is uh, the method that we use to do that. So this is, uh, now here we were very much helped by the, some work which was published in uh, uh, this paper in 2009 uh, by uh, Claudette et al. Uh, and basically they looked at this problem and recommended the following uh, procedure. So uh, there is in fact, you know, you might think, well, you know, take the histogram uh, try to fit, do some curve fitting on the histogram or something like that. Uh, this is not the recommended uh, method. In fact, there is a maximum likelihood estimate for the exponent beta. This is the exponent beta in the power law, which you can calculate directly from the data without any fitting of any kind. Uh, you just take the, um, take the data values, uh, 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 put them into this formula, and you will have the maximum likelihood estimate of uh, the exponent. Uh, now, how do you find where the power law starts? You calculate the kolmogorov smirnov statistic, statistic between the data and the power law. Okay, on the, the power law is, of course, analytic, and the, the data is your numerical data. And that, that, that's the maximum of the difference of the cumulative density function. Uh, cumulative, cumulative distribution function, I'm sorry. Uh, and um, by uh, minimizing that, you can obtain an estimate of this number y min. That's where the power law is supposed to start. So we have two quantities of interest. We have an estimate for the exponent and we know where the power law uh, is starting. Now the goodness of fit and the error bars is a much more involved procedure you need to generate lots of synthetic data sets and then uh, do a lot of fitting of those data sets using the same method and then calculate uh, a histogram for the, for the kolmogorov smirnov statistic and then compare your actual uh, fit with that, with that uh, uh, histogram in order to determine the goodness of fit. The goodness of fit is a number which will tell us, is the fit acceptable? Is it plausible that the, the data fit the power law? If it's too small, you should reject the fit. And if it's uh, anything, uh, uh, let's say 0.1 or 0.5 or something, 0.8 or something like that, you have a good fit. Uh, okay, this involves generating lots of synthetic data sets. That's a little bit involved. You have a power law for y greater than y min. So you can generate that analytically. Uh, or numerically, but using the, uh, uh, using the analytic distribution. Uh, and you, now you don't know what the distribution is for y less than y min. So here you use the bootstrap method that is involving sampling with replacement. Okay, the next thing, assuming, you, now if you, if, in principle, you should stop at step four if the goodness of fit is not acceptable. If it is acceptable, you then go to step five and you sample the original data with, uh, 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 with replacement. Uh, that's the bootstrap method. And this uh, fit all of those and you get your error bars for your fitted parameters. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, in the details of this procedure, I strongly recommend reading uh, this paper where there is a comparison of you know, other methods you might try like fitting to histograms and that, that sort of thing. Now for our purpose, we have uh, to make a modification to this method because 
we have uh, an upper limit on the distribution, which is imposed by the simulation. We're simulating a finite system. We have a finite number of uh, energy levels and a finite level spacing. And therefore we have to adjust uh, or adapt the method to, uh, to deal with that. There are a few changes, but the main one is that the uh, maximum likelihood estimate of beta is now a little more complicated and you in fact need to solve this. You, you calculate this from the data on the left and then on the right, you, you then vary beta until you've solved this equation. But they're not, not particularly difficult, but a little, not quite as simple as the case where y max is infinity. If we take y max to infinity, we reduce to the, the method of uh, et al. Okay, so here is uh, uh, the result of doing that. Uh, you have uh, here the simulation for 96 with, with this exchange coupling four and the solid line. So that's the histogram. The solid line is the, um, is the uh, analytic, well, the solid line is, let's go right back. So the line is this distribution, okay, where this uh, complicated factor here has been approximated as one. So the power law between delta and TK zero. And that's uh, what you see if you plot the uh, distribution, this is TK zero divided by TK. Uh, you have, so low, the tail of the distribution, small condo temperatures is over here. The cutoff is imposed by the fact that we reached the level spacing. Here's a look at the cumulative distribution function. Uh, the dashed line is all of the data, all of the numerical data, and the solid line is the fit so the starting point here is determined, that's why min, that's determined from the data using, by looking at the Kolmogorov-Smirnov statistic. That's where we think the power law starts or where it seems plausible the power law starts based on the data. And then, oh, uh, the cumulative distri distribution function is a probability that the random variable is greater than some value. So it's the integral of the probability density function from y to infinity. And we expect it to work up to some point. Let me mention that if, uh, if, the, if we had a simulation of a continuous system where the uh, level spacing was zero, then we'd expect the power law to work right up to infinity. And in this case, we'd have a straight line. But you can see that you have a deviation from the straight line because there is a finite uh, level spacing in the, in the simulations. But the agreement is, I think, pretty good, at least to the eye. Uh, but as we shall see, uh, the eye is sometimes, uh, sometimes deceives, or sometimes mistaken. Uh, now here I have uh, the complete set of results. Uh, we have the, uh, Okay, what was his exchange coupling system size? Here's the estimate for the exponent beta. This is the error bar, which is not shown here because you'll see the goodness of fit here. Goodness of fit was acceptable in this simulation, somewhat less in this one. Uh, and for large exchange couplings was uh, very, was unacceptable. So in principle, we should reject these fits. Uh, this is an estimate where the things where the power law starts, and here is the number of data which are actually in the tail of the distribution. That is the number of data which satisfy, um, uh, you know, uh, being uh, large enough to be in the tail. Uh, that is, condo temperatures which are small enough to be in the tail of the distribution. Typically, around uh, let's say ten thousand or so, something like that. Now, you'll notice that we have, uh, uh, okay, let's say that the, I think it's reasonable to conclude that the exponent is independent of J and L, at least within the kind of precision that we have. 
uh, here. We can't say much here because we don't know the precision of these estimates and we don't have a good fit in these cases. Uh, there is here some unpublished data, which was uh, these simulations finished uh, with after the publication of our paper um, for smaller uh, exchange coupling. And uh, again, fit, this goodness of fit is, is marginal, I would say, not, uh, not, not acceptable, not uh, acceptable, not unacceptable, somewhere, marg so we say marginal. Uh, but we have about 1.24, which agrees with uh, these values. Um, uh, now, if I look at the thing graphically, um, you can see we have an excellent fit, I would say, for J equal four, and a very good fit for J equals six, but there is some discrepancy here. So uh, I've been trying to work out why uh, there is this small goodness of fit for the uh, um, simulations with large exchange coupling. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it may be related to uh, perhaps to uh, using a, a setting Y max, which I set basically to so the, the, the uh, thinking that the, we should set perhaps a limit at say not the level spacing but ten times the level spacing or a few times the level spacing something like that. That is something I intend to to check. Okay, uh, and this is the uh, showing the same fit. Uh, so we're not fitting to the histogram here. The, the the curve is determined as as previously described, and then we're plotted with the data. And you can see in here, it's certainly, I think, excellent for this case. Perhaps this discrepancy here is what's giving the, the uh, small goodness of fit. Um, I did try to investigate uh, whether this factor, which we have uh, approximated as one, is in fact one. And it's not exactly one, but it's one to within one, one percent. Uh, it's it's uh, the deviation from one is a little more for smaller, sorry, a little more for larger exchange coupling. So it's possible that this may be related to the failure of the fit uh, for the case with large exchange coupling, but still the deviation is very small. So I'm not at all sure that this um, is the explanation. Perhaps it's simply we should cut off the distribution, the data at a, at a let's say twice or three times the level spacing. I will be looking into that. Uh, so the expected value of the exponent uh, is about 1.34 based, uh, based on the parabolic approximation for the multifractal spectrum. Uh, whereas the values in the simulation, I would say are 1.25, 1.24. If we take the numerical estimate of eta, uh, that is, uh, although the, the, the parabolic approximation is used at several points in the, in the analytic derivation, let's suppose that we can, at the end, replace eta by, not by its value from the parabolic approximation, but by its value, for numerical value, we get a slightly better agreement, but again, it's not perfect. Now, there remains a big problem with the uh, number of free moments. Um, excuse me. We find a uh, number of free moments, which is typically, let's say, 40% uh, for, uh, it depends, of course, on the system size. Uh, as you go to infinite system size, this is expected to tend to zero. Uh, there should be no free, uh, once we go to infinite system size, there should be no free mo for moments. But at finite system size, we expect a finite fraction. Uh, now we find values say 40%, 50%, something like that. But the prediction, predicted values, which I'm sorry, are not shown here, are around a few percent or perhaps at most 10%. So clearly, uh, now we do miss, we do overestimate the number of uh, free moments in the, in the simulation, but perhaps by at most a few, few several percent. Nothing like enough to explain this uh, very large discrepancy between the analytic prediction and the 
result in the simulation. So this definitely remains the puzzle for us. I should say that uh, what's the connection with the um, experiment? That would be through the susceptibility uh, and ignoring other effects. So just looking at the number of free moments, so these expected to dominate the, the susceptibility. And as you lower the temperature, more and more of them are screened. That's why we need the condo temperature distribution. Uh, and that then gives you a, a temperature dependence, which is not Curie-like. You have, a, instead of one, an exponent of minus one, you have an exponent which we predict would be between three quarters and two thirds based on uh, the various analytic estimates and our numerical estimate. But uh, in practice, uh, of course, in a real system, there would also be RKKY couplings between the moments. And this would, again, uh, this would also affect the susceptibility. So uh, this is somewhat speculative, perhaps. I should say that, uh, for example, if you look at uh, uh, some of the experiments which were done on uh, the metal insulator transition in dope semiconductors, you can find, in fact, that there are definitely free, free, free magnetic moments. Uh, in, the, in the insulating phase, deep in the insulating phase, I think, in fact, you find that they are free and that the, you have a 1 over T um, uh, temperature dependence. But uh, closer to the metal insulator transition, the exponent does, in seem, does indeed seem to be somewhere between, uh, it's hard to see on the inset perhaps, between a half, uh, it's hard to say there, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, something like that. So not, uh, but again, uh, I should say that uh, this, this uh, behavior is observed over a wide range of concentrations, not just at the critical concentration uh, in the experiment. Okay, let me finish there. Uh, what I've been doing is the work that's, what I've been talking about is the work we presented in this paper. Uh, so please do have a look if you're interested in finding out more about it. Um, it's an numerical investigation of the condo temperature distribution and in particular the power law tail. That's predicted to be universal, providing you look at the right temperature range. Um, universal means it should be independent of system size, of course, independent of exchange coupling, and in principle, the same in any model of the, you know, the, uh, any model that shows the Anderson transition in the same universality class. Uh, the value we get in the simulations for the exponent is slightly less than the predicted value. This might perhaps be something to do with the parabolic approximation that was used in the analytic work, but we don't know. Uh, the number of free moments is uh, definitely puzzling. We have many more free moments in the simulation than um, are predicted in the analytic work. So uh, thank you for listening uh, and uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Professor Slavin for this wonderful talk. Uh, let us thank our speaker. Um, we have uh, time for questions, please. Uh, okay, Kes, uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, is there is any naive physical argument why disorder can decrease, but also increase uh, quantum temperature? Uh, it means that disorder randomly affects uh, the exchange coupling J, makes it larger or smaller, how, how it's possible? Uh, no, uh, at least here, we, we are not uh, looking at any um, fluctuations in the exchange coupling. The exchange coupling is constant. All the fluctuations in the condo temperature come from the fluctuations in the density of states. So let me show that figure for the... Uh, for the figure. It's the fluctuations in the density of states which are producing uh, the um, fluctuations in the condo temperature. But it's, it's rather complicated because we have an integral over all energies. So it's not just the... Um, so you can see, for example, uh, here we have a large spike in the, in the local density of states. I would expect that that would correspond to an increase of the condo temperature above the clean value. But you have also lots of uh, kind of pseudo gaps 
in the um, in the local density of states as a result of the disorder. And these gaps uh, uh, can uh, not only give you a lower condo temperature. I mean, they, they make the it can make the condo temperature very small, but they can also uh, give you a free moment, a zero condo temperature. Once the, the gap is has a uh, there is work showing, uh, for example, pseudo calculation of condo temperature for pseudo gaps, and if the power in the pseudo gap uh, related to the power of the pseudo gap, uh, you have um, uh, a critical value of the uh, exchange coupling, which uh, uh, gives you a free moment. So it's basically the gaps. I think these gaps in the, and this is discussed in the 2012 paper with Stefan relating pseudo gaps. And that's, it was this uh, uh, discussion of pseudo gaps, which led to the prediction for the number of free moments. It's all rather involved, I'm afraid. It's difficult to explain in, uh, briefly, but, um, but it's a fluctuation. In this study, at least, all we are looking at is the, and in the analytic work also, everything comes from the fluctuations. And of course, the fluctuations are correlated. They're not uncorrelated. These fluctuations are correlated. And it's these correlations and the multifractal exponent which give you the, the power law. Okay, thanks. And second question is related to the, our present and future group. You have shown three beautiful pictures, distribution of the wave function uh, uh, below critical disorder and the very beginning of your talk. I mean, uh, this, is this famous paper. The question mm. is this, and the, exactly, this middle picture, if, can we teach computer then that we will present with this distribution and it will tell us are we exactly in the metallic state or at the critical point? I guess the insulator, we can uh, see the difference. But is it well, possible? I think um, there, is, there is, I mean, you can use machine learning to, uh, uh, you can train a, a convolutional neural network to, to recognize uh, localized states, uh, sorry, extended states and localized states. Um, generally speaking, what you have is some, you know, you have some probability that the state is extended to some probability that it's localized. And you find that it goes, say, one over here and zero over here. And there's some broad range where it, you know, uh, moves through a half. And uh, typically you take a half as the prediction for the critical point. But yeah, again, well, yeah. uh, but I would say that the analysis uh, which no doubt would be will be improved uh, for sure. But uh, at least the work I've seen, it, it, uh, it, and I think that Tommy Otsuki will probably be able to answer your question better than than I can. But uh, uh, certainly, you can recognize local uh, extended states and localized states. You can train, and you know, train a neural network with the Anderson model, and you can recognize these things by then presenting wave functions from different models, for example. I'm doing some work at the moment where we're looking at um, wave functions obtained in density functional theory, and then using a network trained with the Anderson model to recognize if they're localized or not. That's, okay. uh, that's uh, ongoing work at the moment. Okay, great, so we'll, we'll do it. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Uh, since I don't see raised hands, maybe let me ask a, a bit more technical uh, question. Uh, so uh, you use, uh, to get local density of states, you use uh, KPM, right? Um, That's right. And, uh, this is uh, the bottleneck of the calculation. Uh, and you mentioned yes. that you used uh, um, some big clusters. Um, and I don't know if I understood correctly, uh, do you do here a uh, Parallel, uh, uh, I mean, can you do parallel? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, on, on... it's, ra it's rather, um, well, we're, we're calculating a large ensemble of, um, mm -hmm. of, of cubic size systems. So, so we it is one, one CPU per disorder realization. Yeah, it's naturally uh -huh. parallel. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. The only okay. thing you have to be careful is to have a parallel independently, statistically independent parallel streams of random numbers. This is why mm -hmm, we use this mm -hmm. particular generator, which can give you, I think, 6,000 uh, streams of parallel random numbers. 
Mm -hmm. And then you can simply run, uh, you know, a fraction of the ensemble on, on each processor. It's very natural parallel, parallelization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there is another question. Uh, Yagmur, please uh, unmute yourself. Yagmur? Um, can we go to the slide 12? Sorry, could you say that again? To which slide? Uh, can, can, uh, 12. Slide 12. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, uh, slide 12. One, two. Oh. I don't have a number here. Ah, oh, okay. yeah, I, I've got it. I've okay. got it. Sorry. Actually, I takes me, to... takes me, uh, takes me a second. Ah, I'm getting there. Really... Slide twelve. Okay, slide twelve. Ah, it this showed one. The, yes. the this one. Yes, yes. Yes. So uh, I am curious, uh, what happens if we reduce the disorder in the first picture? Um, because yeah, how the uh, states look like, the dance of states. Um. Well, if there were no disorder. Uh, just reducing it a little bit. So this is a critical uh, point, right? Yes, this is the critical point. Y yes. I, so I can't answer if... immediately. Um, okay. To be honest, I have studied uh, carefully the critical point, but not, mm -hmm. uh, I've not spent a lot of time looking at um, uh, the uh, local density of states in the diffusive regime. Um, I, from what I remember, the ones I looked at, you still see a lot of fluctuations. Uh, even, for example, we have a critical point here of uh, 16.5. Even for W equal 10 or W equal 5, at least the examples I looked at, you still see a lot of fluctuations. Not at all. Uh, you might expect that, for example, it should become constant or roughly constant, for example, as we go far enough into the, if we, if we reduce the disorder sufficiently. But uh, what I actually see, at least, but I haven't, che I haven't checked that very carefully. And what I see usually is something very fluctuating. OK, thank you. Um, then uh, we have uh, two questions uh, from Alexei. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, I'm not sure whether they're directly related, but I'm also curious. I mean, you looked at the um, Anderson model. Uh, is it known what happens if instead of uh, random disorder, you have something like quasi-periodic disorder? Well, it's not really a disorder, but you use a quasi-periodic potential. Uh, I think there have been a lot of studies of uh, quasi-periodic potentials, um, especially in 1D. Um, uh, you have... Uh, but I think I can't, I can't answer very well, to be honest. I think there certainly are uh, critical states, um, but I, I, can't, I can't answer in detail, I'm afraid. Um, okay, yeah, and then the second question is actually related. So you use the multi, um, multi well, um, the F of alpha, I just forgot the name, the, uh, the correct- The multifractal it. spectrum. Yeah, I'm just curious, are there any alternatives to that? Essentially, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I was reading recently about the uh, kullback libler uh, measure as a way to uh, distinguish the multifractal states from the extended and uh, localized ones. Would that be uh, of any help here or? Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Um, is it possible for you to, uh, to send me an email after with uh... Um, yeah, that reference sure. and I'll have a look. Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah. It sounds interesting. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, I'm afraid. So, uh, well, it uh, seems to I, would I would like to, to have a look at it. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for the comment. Fairly, yeah, it's fairly recent. It was suggested just last year. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I have plenty of data. So, it'd certainly be uh, a different way of analyzing it, would certainly be uh, interesting. Um, okay, then if I may, I have uh, another question. So um, 
you you've said uh, one bottleneck is is the KPM. The other one is the um, heavy analysis that has to be done uh, afterwards to get the goodness of fit. So uh, can you give maybe a, a well, number? Well, I, I wouldn't it, say is, uh, okay. Um, yes, there are there are several steps in the. Uh, Where, where is he? As you can see, uh, sorry. No. I'll get to the slide. Uh, yes, there are several steps and uh, we have to generate a lot of synthetic data sets. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, uh, you know, the amount of time involved is not uh, so much. I mean, a few hours on a laptop. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So this is... Um... This is not much, a bottleneck. Much, much faster. Okay, okay. It's yeah, not a bottleneck. Yeah. I mean, okay. uh, if you're used to doing a fit and you have a result in a in a minute or you know almost you know instantaneously, it it, say, it seems like a long time, but uh, uh, you know it's still only a few hours, so it's not okay, uh, okay. it's not a bottleneck compared to having to run a supercomputer for uh, you know hundreds of hours. It's uh, mm -hmm. the, the bottleneck yes. is definitely. <laughs> The, and what makes this calculation difficult is that to access the, um, you know, to access the, 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 the low condo temperature tail, we must have a, a very small level spacing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so high precision, a, large number of moments, right? Yes, yes. So you have, you, you, you have a distribution which goes from the condo temperature for the clean system down to the level spacing. And if you want to have some decades for which you can do, uh, I mean, if you're doing a power law fit, you, you would like, uh, you know, to have several decades on which to, to try to test if it's really a power law. I mean, one decade is, you know, not really convincing. So uh, then you need to push the level spacing to a very small number. And at the same time, then because the level spacing is very small, you also need to do a lot of, uh, uh, you need a lot of moments. So this is why you get uh, uh, a calculation time of L to the six, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, the six power of the system size. It's not as bad as say, uh, a lot of my previous work was done with Lyapunov exponents and transfer matrices and this kind of thing for the calculating the critical exponent of the Anderson transition. Uh, that's actually worse, that's L to the seven. So this is, uh, this is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question. So maybe I missed, uh, but... Um... You have a magnetic impurities here, right? But uh... Uh, so in the simulation, actually, it's just the Anderson model. Uh, you know what we're doing. So we're supposing that there is a magnetic impurity uh, in theory, but we don't actually uh, simulate the magnetic impurity. Uh -huh, uh -huh. This is taken into account in the Nagaoka Sul Sul equation. Na Nagaoka Sul equation, yes. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So there's no density of magnetic impurities. Basically, you just uh, need no. local density of states. Yes, one could uh, mm -hmm. use KPM to 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 look at interactions among moments by doing for, by looking at RKKY coupling, which could also be calculated uh, by a different integral, but using uh, Using the KPM method, uh, so you could you could imagine. So here we're looking at the at the dilute limit, where there is no interaction between moments. If if we had a finite density of moments, and, and they were close enough to interact with each other, uh, then you'd probably want to not just calculate the condo temperature, but also to calculate the RKKY interaction. Uh, and that would certainly uh, be, be uh, something interesting to do, though I, I haven't. Uh, tried to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So a uh, future plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's uh, probably uh, uh, more difficult than this, uh, but probably doable. Mm -hmm. It certainly uh, was done for by, um, if you w would like to read about that, I think it was, done in this paper, for example, for two dimensions. Uh, I think also for graphene. I think they were looking at, uh, in addition, also graphene uh, in this paper. 
so which may be of interest to you. If you... Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. So I don't see any further questions. Uh, so I suggest uh, we thank uh, Professor Slavin for his wonderful talk again. Uh, thank you to ev everyone for listening. Thanks.